Houston for nearly 30 years. He's also the interim minister of Houston's first Unitarian Universalist Church. He and Maggie visit us usually once a month when Bob inspires us with his wisdom and experiences. In his Houston volunteer activities, Bob has been a child advocate, helped found and continues on the Board of Justice for Children and was on the board of the Houston Area Women's Center. His topic is longing for belonging. Reverend Tucker. I heard from two people that uh, the last time I was on Zoom, there was a lot of paper noise. Uh, I have attempted to uh, uh, fix that. So uh, if there, it gets too noisy or more noisy than you like, uh, just raise your hand and, and uh, or maybe scream something. It was the uh, annual meeting of a Houston organization of which I was the new, newly elected board member. The reception sparkled with uh, gleeful laughter and animated conversation of people who had worked together and served together. For me though, the evening bordered on disaster. At supper, I found myself sandwiched between two three-person conversation clusters. The person on each side, duty done with a perfunctory, hi, my name is, and good to have you here, quickly turned to face the other two others on the other side of them. I could hardly begrudge them their conversational choice, contrasting their vibrant conversations with friends to what would have been with me, the usual probing to try to find some kind of common ground. I could have fidgeted. I could have silently seethed. I could have let my imagination blow up the room. Instead, I really surprised myself by taking three deep breaths, relaxing my body, unfocusing my eyes, and deciding to carry on an intelligent conversation with the one person physically present, myself. Interestingly, the two of us chose to reflect on this month's theme, hospitality and belonging. One would think that over the years, I would have quit paying dues to the lonely crowd society. As a result, I stand in admiration and am a silent cheerleader for those individuals who in gatherings deliberately push aside their own desire to chat with friends in order to create a sense of belonging for the shy, uh, the timid, the lonely. Such individuals I view as gracious saints, possessing a trait seldom listen, listed on a profile or an obituary. Hospitality creates belonging. One such gracious saint uh, surprised me by confessing that she was a very uninteresting person. For when seated at a, at a reception, she would find out much about others, but with few questions directed to her, she decided that she was just not that interesting. Well, not really. Her hospitality of listening provided others with a rare opportunity of monopolizing the time as they talked about themselves. Of course, it's the gregarious life of the party who weaves with wondrous threads, creating community and claims our attention but it is the hospitality of the gracious saints who sensitively, sensitivity recognize the alone person and draws that person into the group to belonging. Well, I found my dinner companion to be a delightful conversationalist and turned what could have been a disastrous evening into 
a delightful, thought-provoking conversation on belonging and hospitality. As the evening ended, this conversational partner and I promised to get together soon. And that we have done. At that meal, what surprised me was my hospitality toward myself. Normally, after such exclusion, I would have left that meeting, that dinner, muttering under my breath about submitting my resignation. But how, I asked myself, did I make myself at home in such a relaxed way in that isolating environment? Well, I traced it back to two factors. The first was a sermon I had recently preached on the familiar Shema, uh, found both in the Old and New Testaments. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, sermons on the Shema quite naturally focus on love for neighbor. However, uh, my attention was caught by that dangling end comment, almost like a little caboose standing there. We are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Could it be, I wondered, if what determines the depth of our genuine love for others is our ability to genu genuinely love ourselves? Well, that insight intrigued me for the sermon. And I thought that uh, love of self was a strange statement to be written some 2,800 years ago. In that sermon, I concluded mm -hmm. that a proper love for neighbor rests on a love of oneself, and a proper love of God rests on a love for neighbor and a love oneself. If that is true, then self-love or self-acceptance or self-appreciation or self-belonging is truly important. Uh, thus, days after the dinner and analyzing what happened at the meal, I began to understand why I could have such a conversation with myself, for I had come to accept my belonging to myself. If that sounds a bit strange, bear with me. For as I thought about this, I discovered that Life really works against us belonging to ourselves, embracing ourselves. To love ourselves is an extraordinarily simple, yet because of our histories, extraordinarily difficult to do. Uh, think of your own history. Each of us has lived being continually wrong or inadequate continually. Think about it. First, for a decade and a half, our parents directed our lives in dress and manners and thoughts and friends <clears throat> and seeking to make us reasonable and accept acceptable adults. Then overlapping those years and extending beyond there are all those educators mar marking our lives with A's and B's and C's and D's. Any F's? Well, actually, I was threatened to fail seventh grade because of my poor spelling. It sounds sort of absurd now, but at the time, <clears throat> the threat was genuinely felt. <clears throat> then there are those various peer groups of which we were a part who enforced a certain conformity, and we scurried around to fall in line. I'm going to add Mary to this list since with the merging of two lives, <clears throat> one's partner allows and discounts certain behaviors. When uh, Francis Haugen, 
a former product manager of Facebook spoke, spoke before a Senate hearing this week, she stated that the company put its quote, astronomical profits before people, end of quote. She told of girls in America taking in content that was intended to make one hate one's body as an adolescent rite of passage. And the core of this marketing, the message endures. You are riddled with flaws and imperfections, and we will tell you what to buy and what to do to fix yourself. <coughs> It doesn't end with when we become functioning adults. There are the ads on television directing us to ills we never knew we had or behavior we never even considered deviant. Programs to lose weight or to get enough sleep or to regularly eliminate our waste or whatever product is being sold, pills and programs to solve all those problems. I think we unconsciously absorb that message that somehow we're not quite perfect. And we need this product, this program, in order to fulfill ourselves. Otherwise, we just don't measure up. And alas, as I have found, uh, all of this uh, being corrected doesn't end with age, for I find now my adult children freely offer advice on how I can improve my less than functional life. So in this long, lifelong web of being judged, evaluated, pressured, corrected, can we find space where we can just relax and love ourselves find that we belong to ourselves. It didn't happen to me until I was at that organization's annual meeting, supper. And at that point, I was already in my 50s. But in preparing that sermon, it did prepare me for being that evening hospitable to myself. But there was a second factor in this ability to be hospitable to myself. <clears throat> it was a quote that I had recently run across by G.K. Chesterton. Uh, Chesterton was uh, active really in the first half of the last century, and he was an English writer, philosopher, lay theologian, and literary critic. And he had the deliberate habit of making his points with popular sayings by turning them inside out. The comment that he turned inside out and caught my attention was this, original sin is the most cheerful doctrine. Original sin is the most cheerful doctrine. When I first read that, I thought Chester is Chesterton must be out of his cotton-picking mind. But then I figured he was too important a, of a writer to dismiss so casually. I believe that at least part of what he meant was that once you strip from that doctrine of original sin, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, what you had left was the common feature all of us humans have. We sin which one of us can lay claim to perfection or purity or faultlessness or innocence? Well, given that cheerful doctrine, we can give up the standards that we carry around with us from parents and teachers and occupational training and even the TV ads. And then once giving them up, we no longer have to measure ourselves and in measuring ourselves coming in at second best. That's why uh, Chesterton's cheerful doctrine of original sin uh, came to be so important to me. It relieved me of that which weights me down. 
what I've done is to speak of belonging, belonging to oneself in such a way that uh, one is freed not only from the illusion of being pure and holy, but also uh, freed from the measuring sticks that clutter our minds and impede our living. What I want to do now is with the remaining time I have is to speak to the other side of the love commandment. Uh, we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. In speaking about loving our neighbor, I move from the singular to the plural, from the individual to the group. Loving others is getting more difficult in this nation. A new poll at the University of Virginia Center for Politics tells us that many, uh, that many uh, Democrats and Republicans are, uh, excuse me, I just, okay. Uh, a new poll at the University of Virginia Center for Politics tells us that many Democrats see a fascist when they look at Republicans and many Republicans see communists when they look at Democrats. Uh, you know, the, the white uh, supremacist and uh, the, the socialist communist. So we just don't have political arguments these days. We have fascists fighting with communists. The latest poll from Rasmussen report shows a plurality of 43% of Americans believing that our best days are now behind us. And 33% believe that the best days are ahead of us. Well, another 23% are just unsure. But where did the optimism and the hope that Americans always were known for go? Then another statistic, 41% of Biden voters and 52% of Trump voters at least somewhat agree that the time has come now to split the country into red and blue states. Now, I don't think that would come about, but the very fact that people are thinking about it is something new for me. There was a recent editorial that read, quote, get the message, GOP, Dems hate you and they don't want to be your friends. From other editorials that I read, the headline could read, get the message Dems, GOPs hate you and they don't want to be your friends. How did we get into such divisiveness in our comments about and relationship with others? Well, the place where this is uh, showing up uh, very clearly in editorials and in news items these days is in the whole area of vaccines and mask wearing, the critical impasse. Now, I am vaccinated and I am puzzled at the obstinacy of those who adamantly resist those measures. However, in listening uh, to those who are not being vaccinated, uh, who refuse to be vaccinated, what I find is that uh, for, a for many, a matter of, it is a matter of principle and not just uh, trying to put some sand into the operation. We Americans like those who hold fast to principles. In fact, I when I read, wrote that, the first thing, first person I thought about was Nathan Hale remaining faithful to his convictions, even in the face of death. And of course, there have been all kinds of other people in American history. There's a lot of conviction behind this uh, not wanting vaccines. Uh, people are quitting their jobs due to vaccine requirement. They lose the possibility of unemployment insurance. 
they lose, potentially lose pension accumulations. They may lose health insurance. Listen to what is happening and indeed around the country. And I'm just collecting things that most of you have read in the paper at one time or another, but I'm putting them one place. Erie County Medical Center in New York had roughly 400 hospital staff who were unvaccinated by New York's September 27th deadline and were placed on leave. It represents about 5% of its total workforce. A lot of people. Houston Methodist was the first to announce in Texas a vaccine mandate and said it had 153 resignations or terminations among its roughly 26,000 person workforce. And this has forced the hospital to halt elective inpatient surgeries and cut back on other services. New York City Mayor Bill DeVasio's administration said that roughly 5,000 of the city's public health healthcare workers had not met the state's vaccination deadline. Although not allowed to work, city officials are reportedly hoping that those workers, um, about 10% of the public hospital uh, system workforce will choose to be uh, vaccinated and return to their jobs later in the, in the week. And then a Dr. Christopher Rake, an anesthesiologist at the UCLA Health Center was escorted out of his workplace for refusing to get a COVID-19 vaccine. Well, unvaccinated patients at the UC Health in Colorado are going to have a tough time getting organ transplants, as the Health Network said that both donors and recipients will be required to get vaccinated in almost all situations. To move away from the uh, uh, health, the Seattle Police Department braces for mass firing of officers as hundreds have yet to show proof of vaccination. And actually this could be as high as 403. And that would be in addition to the 111 officers awaiting uh, results of exem uh, exemption request. And on top of that, of the 300 officers that left since the height of the defunding debate in 2020. Devor, uh, people uh, are not doing this, not all anyway, just as a matter of being obstinate. There's some real conviction going in there that's causing significant changes in their lifestyle. It's gone beyond this. Divorced parents who disagree about vaccinations are now ending up in court. This week, a man was asked to wear a mask in the Apple store in Manhattan, and he attacked and stabbed the store guard who asked him to do that. But it's not just happening in our country. Thousands marched in Rome to protest workplace vaccination rule, clashing with police as they protested Italy's new Green Pass vaccination requirement for, empo for employees to enter their offices. And in Australia, the unvaccinated are warned of social isolation if they don't get vaccinated even after the state lifts all restrictions against them on December 1st. Well, how do we go about uh, loving others if we have some self-love? Well, I think we can honestly reach out to others, disagreeing when necessary, but never denying others their basic humanity. We don't have to denigrate to disagree. 
We don't have to de demonize to disagree. We can still disagree and still respect and love the person with whom we disagree. What I find in many of the resistors to the vaccines, and uh, I want to restate that I have been vaccinated I, and I believe that people ought to get vaccinated. But what I find in many of the resistors to the vaccine is that outside of those who do so for a political statement is a deep stated conviction. On Abraham Maslow's pyramid of human needs, just above the basic physiological needs of air, food, water, and housing, is found, which is found at the first level, is the sense of belonging. We really have a need of connectedness that I have come to believe starts with a genuine loving of oneself, of being connected to oneself. Uh, I hope for you that's possible. Well, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>